Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Vivek Sarkar from, let me take this off. I'm Vivek Sarkar from Georgia Tech, and it's my pleasure to start this invited talk session by introducing our first speaker, Satoshi Matsuoka, who is really well known to all of us in the SC community. So Satoshi is the director of Riken CCS, uh, the top tier HPC center that created Fogaku that he's going to talk to us about. Uh, he was also the leader of the Subame series of com supercomputers uh, from Tokyo Institute of Technology, where he still holds a professor position and is actively engaged in research in HPC, scalable big data, and AI. Satoshi has written over 500 articles, shared many conferences. He was program chair for SC13. Uh, he's a fellow of ACM and European ISC, uh, and has won many, many awards. Uh, I don't have time to go through all of them, uh, but uh, they include uh, the ACM Gordon Bell Prize in 2011, uh, the uh, 2014 IEEE CS Sydney Fernbach Memorial Award, uh, the HPDC 2018 Achievement Award, and recently the SC Asia 2019 HPC Leadership Award. Uh, so it's a great opportunity for us to hear from Satoshi, and please join me in welcoming him as he talks to us about Fugaku, the first exascale computer. Thank you, Vivek. Uh, is my mic on? Okay. And uh, uh, before I start my talk, uh, I'd like to give a uh, little bit of introduction to the uh, in memory of Hiroshi Nakashima, our longtime colleague, contributor to SC and all, uh, HPC in general in Japan, also glo uh, globally. Unfortunately, uh, Hiroshi was struck by a bus about a, uh, about a month ago, and unfortunately, he didn't survive. So I'd like to uh, just uh, mention that um, uh, his, pa his unfortunate passing, but try to remember his achievements uh, rather than just uh, you know, weeping over his uh, unfortunate situation. So with that said, um, I'd like to talk about Fugaku. Uh, and then I'll talk about uh, briefly about what it can do. And then I'd like to talk about the future, where we go from here. So Fugaku uh, is a name for Mount, uh, no, it's, uh, it's Mount Fuji. Um, so the supercomputer we have had been named that way because uh, we wanted to achieve the two fairly contradictory uh, uh, properties in supercomputers. In fact, that had been a, our ambition even before Fugaku when we, I was doing the Tsubame uh, project back in the two, like 2007 for the first Tsubame one. So we want not only to achieve high performance, uh, which is, of course, you know, the uh, principal objective of building these big supercomputers, but also we want these supercomputers to be applicable to wide-ranging applications and, in fact, be a uh, core of uh, mainstream IT. So it has to have broad applicability, broad user base, broad range of applications, et cetera, et cetera. So satisfying both is ideal, and as Mount Fuji being a standalone mountain so sort of signifies uh, our idealism. But, um, you know, but this is hard. We all know, you know that you know, it'll be great if we can do that, but unfortunately, this objective is hard. In fact, it's like, uh, uh, you know, it's, uh, in some cases, when you try to reach something like exascale performance, it becomes an insurm insurmountable goal. So um, what we set out to do is not so much reach exaflop in Limpac, uh, we threw, uh, threw that, that objective away you know, fairly immediately, but rather say it will be applications first. So we want to build a machine which will demonstrate uh, exascale performance, what we expect out of an exascale machine, um, in a broad range set of applications, while, of course, being very efficient, very powerful, but also very broad. And we would involve everybody uh, in the course in Japan, but also our, uh, our partners like the US and Korea um, and Europe, et cetera, to basically try to uh, co-design a machine that would, be, uh, that would achieve the goal. But if, and we set this really high bar. 
that we would do, do this by you know, like now 20, 2020, which we knew was hard, it would be hard. Uh, but so it was like a moonshot project. Fortunately, we have achieved this with uh, these uh, co-design activities. So the, the chip we uh, designed, Fujitsu and I, and we can go uh, design together, ASICRFX, it's an ARM processor. So it's general purpose, it can run any code, ARM code you throw at it. It can even boot Windows and run PowerPoint. But also, you know, it's a, it's a chip, at least uh, when it was introduced, was three times, about, about three times faster compared to a mainstream CPU uh, of the time, also three times more power efficient. So co combined, uh, it, was, it was a very excellent chip for uh, HPC, and what we did was, uh, after developing the chip, we combined 160,000 of them, and then uh, I put it in one room. And of course, I'll talk a little bit about the inter interconnect technology also. Uh, so this 160,000 nodes is equivalent to uh, about 20 million smartphones because it's a valid comparison because it runs the same code. But uh, 20 million smartphones is like uh, a number equivalent to the number of smartphones sold annually in Japan. So, so if you put Fugaku in context, if you have two or three of these Fugakus, it's like, uh, you know, encompassing the entire IT needs of Japan. So uh, it's, you know, exascale machines are of that magnitude. So upcoming uh, exascale machines in the US, et cetera, uh, are, uh, will be as well. So um, of course, uh, as a chip developed, um, uh, we'll have to have some leadership quality. So, and it's, so I already talked a little bit about the CPU. It's, it was the first uh, seven nanometer uh, server CPU. Um, and we did valid comparisons of various uh, benchmark, not so much LIMPAC, but the application benchmark for open source and et cetera. And uh, it was about three times faster per socket per socket comparison. And, uh, uh, or three times power efficient, which, which, whichever you, you would take it. And this was achieved by new features like scale vector extensions. And also it was, it's the first and still the only CPU to accommodate high bandwidth memory like the GPUs. Um, it has a, a mainframe grade resiliency. That's what you need when you have 106,000 nodes. And of course, it's ARM compliant. But, but supercomputers are not just you know, uh, CPUs. We need interconnect. And uh, we designed uh, an evolution of the Tofu network from, uh, from the K computer. Uh, each chip has about 400 gigabit second capability. It's all embedded on the die. And in fact, it's not, it's not, not just the interface, the switch it's all embedded in the dock, very much like uh, Blue Gene uh, that IBM had built. So we can, uh, and with the uh, disaggregation um, feature, which I will not talk about here much, as much, I'll talk about in the panel, following subsequent panel, we achieve a half a second microsecond, half a microsecond latency, which is, you know, even compared to Rocky, um, it's amazingly fast compared to data centers. So it's the first uh, server grade CPU, I think, uh, with general ISA to um, integrate the switch. And what you may argue that Bluegene was, but uh, you know, uh, but, all, but you know, at this but running ARM processor and so forth. So uh, since it has a 10 port switch, uh, it has up to 1.6 million network ports all embedded on a die. And uh, I'll talk about a little bit about that. So it has six petabytes per second injection bandwidth, which is about 10 orders, uh, one order of magnitude greater than all the IDC uh, traffic combined in the world. So, um, so I already talked a little about A4FX. You know, this has a modest performance in terms of things like FP64. Of course, this supports some of the modern um, features like 16-bit and floating point arithmetic for AI and so forth. Uh, but there are unique features like, uh, again, I said TOF integration and, and so forth, and, and integrates uh, HBM too. So when you look at um, um, A4FX processor, uh, from 30,000 feet or 10,000 meters, which is more of an international standard, I think. Um, it's, a, it's a mini core ARM processor. This has 48 cores plus four cores used for operating system services. And um, so, you know, it's a, it's, uh, it's a, if you don't, if you're not cognizant, it's a supercomputing chip, it's just like any other ARM processor. So we even had contests for high school students and they readily used the machine, you know, uh, to port the code they had on the PC, just, just, shipped the source code, compiled it, it just worked out of the box. 
Uh, but it's also an accelerated GPU-like processor. Now, the reason we get such high performance, with, because just like GPUs or any other modern incarnations, or even in the past, you know, a lot of GPUs are modern incarnations of a vector processor. So it has a, a very wide vector uh, uh, with multiple, uh, with double pumping, um, and also has HTM2, but also it has uh, many features within a chip to enhance the bandwidth. So it can, it's a streaming processor. It's not like we have different GPU in the chip, it's that each core acts very much like a streaming processor when, when needed. So uh, we s sort of get best of both worlds. We get GPU-like performance um, uh, while being compatible with uh, much of the uh, software ecosystem. Um, so I'll talk a bit about um, uh, some of the other features. Uh, we, were, uh, we had to be very aggressive about power management because we have 160,000 processors and we can't afford each chip to be, you know, have a TDP of 300, 400 watts. So we have to be really power efficient and there are many features, but I'll just introduce one of them. So we have, not only we have a dynamic control uh, to, uh, for example, clock gating and so forth, but, but we, have stat, uh, we also have con uh, ways to turn off parts of the chip when required. Uh, so on the pipeline, we can slow down the memory, et cetera. And these can, can even be set by the user with uh, appropriate privileges. So for example, when you have a memory bound applications which are dominant in, uh, in this PC code, you can turn off the execution pipe, one of the execution pipes completely to save power. In fact, uh, we encourage people to do that and uh, we are trying to have, um, uh, ver uh, to implement this, implement a software layer on top. For example, power cognizance scheduling, which allow, which will, in fact, we will charge people by power and they'll be, uh, they'll be encouraged or incentivized to find the best setting, turning off execution units and so forth so they become the best, most, most uh, energy efficient. And they can do that by, let's, let's say, turning off or adjusting the various parameters of the chip. Also important is resilience, because like I said, when you have 160,000 nodes or chips, resiliency becomes tantamount. So it's really important that uh, the chip be as, uh, uh, be as reliable as possible. And we achieve this by uh, incorporating main grade, mainframe grade uh, RAS, which of course Fujitsu is good at because they've been building these uh, RAS for mainframes for the past you know, 40, year, 40, 50 years. Uh, but you know, um, uh, Fujitsu has uh, put in um, uh, a plethora of these uh, 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 RAS features, which off, we often forget. This, uh, you know, we think software, uh, uh, we think software uh, fault tolerance can cover, you know, uh, these uh, inadequacies for small systems. Well, yes. But for very, very large system, exascale level systems, we really, really need uh, mainframe grade RAS uh, as a baseline. And then put, we put software layer on top. And uh, about the network, um, like I said, TofuD logic is embedded entirely in the die. So as you can see here, um, where, where's the laser pointer? Am I a laser pointer? I don't know. Okay, anyhow. Uh, so uh, it occupies, it's, it's separate from the PCI RAS. So the Tofu D is uh, the interconnect is directly and uh, directly interconnected to the on chip uh, on chip uh, network and not through the uh, I/O port. It occupies about 25 million, you know, millimeters of die area, and the power of the entire uh, network complex per node is about eight to nine watts, which at maximum uh, TDP of the entire node, it's about uh, uh, it's about five percent. So and this includes you know, 30s and AOC, Donix, which is actually very expensive uh, power-wise. And again, this includes a switch, not, not, just, the, uh, not just the interface. So, you know, uh, so for, at least for Fugaku, and we get 400 gigabits injection into, onto the network. So Fugaku uh, was built uh, very power efficient, and this interconnect uh, really helps because when you have external uh, uh, networks, sometimes they become significant part of your power profile. And again, it has direct, uh, allows us to direct DMAC, meaning you know, we can ship any parts of memory from the, directly from the on-chip bus onto any other memory or even to the L2 cache of other processors. This allows us to significantly reduce the MPI latency. Uh, so as a bench, benchmark, you get about uh, half, half a microsecond latency uh, to, uh, uh, between the nodes. 
And then we get very uh, uh, significant utilization of the link. We get about 93% utilization. So we can achieve about 40 gigabytes per second uh, in, data, in data transfer between the nodes. Uh, so this is enclosed in a very dense configuration, obviously. Um, we have two, uh, two dies on a package uh, on, a, on a single board, but it's, a, it's not a dual socket. It's a single socket. We have two nodes here for uh, uh, packaging requirements. And we have 384 nodes, about 100 kilowatt rack, and it's all water-cooled. And, uh, and, we have, and then we have 432 of these racks. And uh, I'm, show, I'm sorry I couldn't show you the video. I embedded a YouTube video. You know, going through the machine, it's like going through an English maze. And um, uh, so it's, uh, it was massive. I really wanted to show it, but unfortunately the YouTube embedding didn't work at the last minute. So you have to kind of imagine in your head. You take, for example, you know, it's like a Google data center, just rows and rows and rows, but it's very clean. That's the difference. So we get about uh, half a hexaflop on you know, the 64 bit, and uh, about a hexaflop in 32 bit, and uh, uh, you know, two hexaflop in, sing, uh, in 16 bits. But more importantly, uh, we get about 163 petabytes per second uh, memory bandwidth. And that's the largest memory band bandwidth that's uh, ever been recorded on, on a machine. And that gives us a significant uh, performance advantage. So the recently announced uh, uh, top 500 list, um, HPCG, HPLI, and Graph 500, and now the MLPerf HPC, uh, we have, been, we have um, fortunately have become number, number one in all of the benchmarks. Um, and especially um, HPCG, we're about five times uh, greater compared to the second rank machine, which is, which is also an excellent machine, it's a summit. But uh, as you can see, uh, in, uh, uh, Fugaku excels not just on the top 500, it's not a limpack machine. Well, fortunate to be number one, and you know, there are other competitors and so forth. But our objective is not to be number one there. We're not even number one on any of these benchmarks but it's important that we do well on all the benchmarks because, will, because otherwise we will not be able to satisfy the requirements that it will be, and the Fugaku will be widely applicable to a wide ranging sets of applications significant as IT infrastructure because otherwise, you know, if you're just building for Limpact, you're not gonna get that. And uh, of course, in fact, the real objective was to do excellent and all of uh, uh, nine sort of very important our target applications, which are mostly, there are some basic science, but for mostly talks about sustainability goals, things like personal medicine, uh, like medicine pharmaceutical, energy, disaster prevention, um, uh, climate, also manufacturing, et cetera, et cetera. So these are, uh, material, uh, these are sort of uh, goals that are really important because, uh, of course, very important because, you know, why do the taxpayers shell out like billion dollars for this project. Well, because they, the expectation is that, that this machine will improve their daily lives and will achieve sustainability goals. Will provide and will become the means of digital transformation to achieve these sustainability goals. So that's the real objective of the machine. And, uh, uh, and the reason these, why these target applications have been set that way is to basically drive those goals. And the goal was to achieve two orders of magnitude almost, and uh, some of the applications achieve more than two orders of magnitude speed up. So fortunately, we have met our goal. We get about 70, about uh, 70 uh, X performance gain over the K computer, a previous machine. And then for some of the applications like um, Genesis, which is molecular dynamics for pharmaceutical, uh, 127 X for Nick LTKF, which was last year's Gordon Bell um, candidate uh, for uh, weather and climate. Uh, we have achieved about more than 100 times speed up. Uh, but being general purpose, the software stack of uh, Fugaku is very general purpose. So on one hand, we have the traditional HPC software stack. So any of you who wants to run Fortran 77 code efficiently, yes, you can, okay? So we can cover any sort of dusty deck uh, legacy code. But also, uh, all the, because being ARM and general purpose and running, for example, Red Hat Enterprise right out of the box, no modifications because of the ARM processor compliant with all the standards. It can run other, the modern software stack involving clouds, big data, AI, and so forth. So, uh, so and these are sort of uh, merged transparently. We also support containers and so forth. So you can create your own environment. Uh, we support singularity. 
And then the, uh, we, uh, we also support SPAC as part of our collaboration with DOE. So, uh, so basically, it can, uh, so we get the best of both worlds in a very transparent manner. We get the traditional HPC uh, model-based simulation. We get you know, more data-driven kind type of simulation. We also encompass a lot of the require, needs and requirements and applications that are eminent, emanating from the cloud and, and modern IT infrastructure. So, uh, uh, so with that, with those um, equipments or the weaponry on hand, uh, Fugaku really attempts to solve what we call Society 5.0. Society 5.0 is really about, in, in a short sets of words, trying to achieve SDG goals, uh, achieve digital transformations in, uh, in various uh, SDG goals. And uh, so this is just a slide I borrowed from uh, their people. Um, and uh, there are various uh, Society 5.0 or SDG objectives, but it turns out, of course, that uh, you know, these objectives are uh, very much the same as uh, what Fugaku have been designed for. And the way to achieve it, they conceive, is that uh, you create all these digital twins in cyberspace. The digital twins are really about, you know, the core digital twin is simulation technology. And of course, there are other associated technology, uh, like AI and big data, which Fugaku, of course, you have, uh, have to demonstrate to you good at. Um, Fugaku is uh, considered now by the Japanese government and also uh, broad sets of industry partners that's the best means uh, of being, uh, being a core for this uh, uh, in, uh, Society 5.0 revolution. So, you know, and there are many, many applications running on Fugaku to realize this, and, but since we're very short on time, I'll just introduce you uh, our COVID program to, uh, that are consistent with the goal, and in particular focus on the, the, the predict um, about simulating the aerosol droplet, which, um, which was a Gordon Bell finalist. So the so difficulty in COVID-19 is um, this is the work done by Makoto Tsurokura, and I contributed a little bit, uh, a little bit about it in the work as well, is that the droplets and aerosols are invisible. So as I speak, I'm spooling aerosols and droplets. So, you know, Bronis is sitting in front of me. So if, you know, you might fear that, you know, I'm spewing, if I'm infected, you know, he'll be getting a whole bunch of viruses that he might entail. Well, no, wearing a mask, Bronis only reduces this by about 70% with your mask. Okay, um, but, it's, but he's safe because we know that droplets only, uh, the simulation shows that droplets, most of the major droplets uh, only have a distance of about one meter. So I'm standing about three meters from him, so he's very safe. What's not safe is, of course, these aerosols because as droplets travel through the air, uh, some are already aerosols when, you know, when it's exerted out of your mouth, but even, the, uh, some, even some of the larger droplets, as they travel, they evaporate and become aerosols. And once they become aerosols, they stagnate in the air for a very long time. And this is a primary mode of transmission of COVID, as experts uh, seem to be finding out. So these uh, virus-containing aerosols, you stay in the room for a long time, the aerosols float in the air, and then you inhale it uh, without good ventilation, and thus you, know, you get a cluster of infections. That's, that's how COVID spreads. And, uh, but this was kind of known, but not known in a very quantitative fashion uh, because it was very difficult to uh, do experiments. You know, people have, have boxes, they put these uh, dummy heads, and they try to spew, you know, water and try to collect the uh, aerosol particles. But, you know, it was, it was not in a realistic situation. It's very, very difficult to conduct any sort of experiments. So what we did was, to, and so what the civil crowds team did, was to take industrial grade CFD simulation capabilities developed for Fugaku, which will scale to the, well, up to the entire machine if needed. And then, uh, which is used for various purposes, but in particular for something like um, uh, engine combustion simulation, okay, and very complicated geometrical boundaries, you know, very complicated physics, multi-physics, and in particular, you have fuel injection. And if you notice, fuel injection looks very similar to someone spewing droplets and aerosols. In fact, it's almost the exact same physics. So we were able to take the applications which had been, which were being co-designed for Fugaku for massive, ultra-fine detail in, in millimeters, and also with very quick geometry. These uh, fine geometries will take weeks to generate. It's not just a simulation that's expensive. It's these geometry um, generations that are expensive. 
But because of the new method, not only get scalability, high resolution, but we, we can also generate these geometry, accurate geometry from CAD in a matter of minutes. So this allowed us to uh, generate uh, lots of social, uh, social situations of COVID transmission. So, and of course, we have many partners um, uh, coming from Japan. We had also had like U.S. company like Boeing, which is not shown here, unfortunately. I'm sorry. And of course, uh, academic partners as well, but also a lot of collaborations and requests from the government, from both uh, national and also local governments. For example, Kobe City, where Kogaku is at, they really wanted to simulate how do we protect the paramedics. When, we, when they carry patients in the ambulance, what's the best protective measure? Because we don't know if that person is infected uh, when, you, you know, when you have an emergency. So, uh, so in fact, over the period of about 17 months, uh, we created more than 1,000 societal si situations. And of course, these societal situations, they have multiple, multiple numbers of uh, these digital twins. And, as, uh, and the bar graph below is the number of infections in Japan Fortunately, it's very low now. It's about, about 100 to 200 for the entire nation. It's very low. But every time it started seeing a peak, then uh, we would say, OK, what's, what's going to be the next uh, danger here? What's going to be the critical area? And then uh, we would say, like, restaurants, public transportation, karaoke boxes, um, of course, classrooms, airplanes, barbecue, and, of course, uh, also combine, you know, combine it with local simulations like masks, face shields, and then be able to, and combine with uh, epidemiological uh, analysis of uh, simulations also now embedded recently. So we have end-to-end -end simulation capabilities of the infection probability. We were able to present to people, here are the dangers. Here it's okay. So, and, and very, instead of going to a full total lockdown, allow people to be very selective in the way they would protect themselves from COVID and be, become very cognizant. And uh, these, so uh, over, and this was not cheap. So over uh, one, and a, uh, one and a half years, this uh, entire sets of COVID simulation uh, generating more, more than 1,000 uh, 1, scenarios consumed nearly, well, 17.5, well, nearly 20 million uh, node hours on Fugaku which is equivalent to taking like a 30 petaflop, you know, now sort of mid-range, but sort of still very high up there in the top, top 100 supercomputer and dominating it, use, have exclusive use of it for the entire year. So you have to have a critical supercomputer, um, a good sized supercomputer. If you dedicate this to this particular work, then you get the same result, but you have to dedicate the entire supercomputer. It's that level of capacity. And remember, we have other COVID projects too, which can consume more, even more uh, compute capacity. So multiply this by several times for all the COVID programs. Basically, the COVID calculations that Fugaku undertook was almost like, was almost like dominating all the other supercomputers in Japan combined for mitigation. And, uh, and this was carried over, you know, I'm sorry, Mac, um, like 300 newspapers, 350 TV broadcasting, and more than 1,000 web news. So every time we release something, it would be just broadcast over the news. And this really helped to disseminate public awareness and also helped to set public policies. Okay, so Fugaku was really being used as an instrument by the government to really predict what, would, what, what, uh, what, uh, what kind of uh, contingency measures needed to protect people from uh, from uh, COVID, uh, COVID risks. And uh, we feel, you know, even as Fugaku was just propping up, it was still in pre-production when we started this, uh, it was a real success and other COVID measures as well. And uh, I think that's one of the reasons why uh, this particular work is nominated, along with the, uh, uh, with the uh, cosmic uh, simulation as uh, one of the Gordon Bell finalists, and of course this one for the Gordon Bell. Um, uh, for the Gordon Bell uh, Award for COVID. And we'll see what happens this afternoon because the war ceremony, but you know, irrespective of whether we win or not, I think with it really fulfilled, not only did it good for the public, but also we really fulfill, uh, demonstrated and fulfilled our objectives for Fugaku already. Okay, 
And then, of course, this will be fed back, uh, the results of this fed back to other applications uh, where this, uh, the cube, the simulation program originated from, especially for, uh, not only for infection, but also for achieving, uh, for example, carbon neutrality, uh, for designing new turbines uh, that would uh, be burning not just um, uh, natural gas, but uh, uh, combined with ammonia, which is really difficult, but you know, it would be used for that kind of purpose. Now, Fugaku, the job filling rate is almost um, over 90%. And also, if we look at the power profile, it's much lower than our design goals. So under normal production, it's about 20 megawatts on average, including cooling. And, uh, and since we're hitting about 90%, so if you believe that Fukaku is sort of an exascale machine, not, you know, not an exaflop exascale machine by no means, by no means, but sort of a, you know, a machine that you expect the exascale machines would, uh, would perform, then uh, we sort of reached the DOE goal of achieving exascale performance with 20 megawatts. But this is in production with real application, okay, not on impact. Okay, moving forward, I don't have a lot of time, so I'll just go, go move forward. So we're looking at next generation. I'm sorry for some of the Japanese. Uh, but it turns out that's really difficult. It's gonna be really difficult moving forward from Fugaku. So, uh, of course, everybody will say, okay, Okay, you gotta go to domain-specific accelerators. But I'm gonna claim it's not that simple. Because you know, there are all kinds of different types of accelerated packaging. You have on-chip integration, you have multi-chip packaging, you have on-node accelerators like GPUs and separate card, and you have separate machines. But irrespective, you know, since my run time is running out, I just want to send a message saying, accelerators are a means to an end. That's not the objective. Which, what this indicates is the fact that we really have to be cognizant of how you would accelerate and the principles of how you accelerate. In fact, the reality is that you know, for most people, accelerators are kind of evil. You know, it's not, you know, it's not, they're, they're great for performance, for, but they're not good for programming. We've got to go to a types of program model. And you know, this cloud was successful because everything was um, hidden under the hood. And also, then, because it involves massive software ecosystems, it's very really hard to force software. And for GPUs have been very successful. You know, I've been very involved in GPU and I still am. Uh, but for Aquas for FX, why did we adopt ARM? Well, that's because we are you know, very cognizant of the needs of the ecosystem. But even aside from those issues, which can be argumentative, there's a fundamental principle we have to follow which is the MDOS law, or strong scaling law, or the Gustafsson's law. And this, these laws tell you, right out of the box, that employing multiple heterogeneous accelerators in a very complicated way is exactly the wrong idea. You should not do that. In fact, why we get performance is there are homogeneous parallelization workloads exclusively confined to a single accelerator type, let's say CPU or GPU, depending on the situation, is the only way to get performance. And I'm not saying accelerators are bad, they're good. But you have to design your machine and the application in a way, application in a way that for large systems, these applications will run almost exclusively on one accelerator type. Otherwise, you're not going to get performance or scalability for that matter. And that's really, okay, then I'll spend maybe one or two minutes just to explain this. So if you look at the Amdahl's law, we all know that. And the, the extreme asymptotic, uh, the extreme of Amdahl's law is that the accelerated component, acceleration component becomes zero. And of course, that's why people thought initially that parallel computing would not work. And then John Gustafson, uh, showed in his first Gordon Bell uh, attempt that uh, there's a, by parallelizing across uniform workloads, you can get, the time solution will not decrease, but your performance will increase because the parallelized components will increase, your problem size will increase, the parallelized components will increase proportionally. So the non-parallelized portion, the performance ratio the ratio that's pertinent to performance decreases proportionally, uh, in, inverse proportionally. So thus you get, the, you know, with large systems you get perfect speed up, okay? 
So when you combine these two, you find that the no perform uh, it really is becomes hard to satisfy the Gustafson law because the accelerated portion becomes this becomes really small. They have to achieve low balance on this extremely small workload. Okay. So that means any sort of perturbations, be it perturbation by operating system, perturbation by heterogeneity, becomes insurmountable to control. And of course, we've known this. There are lots of work. It's, I'm not claiming this the first time anyone observed this. It's, 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 it's known, but people forget this for heterogeneous computing. So maximizing acceleration under Amdahl's law is the dominant processing should be done on the same accelerator every node. So intranode heterogeneous processing is bad. Okay? So you have to put your workload dominantly on a single accelerator at one time. And I have to achieve extreme uniform load balance because you're accelerating. So heterogeneous tax parallelism is bad. Okay? And you have to minimize parallelization overhead. So you have to really achieve, try to achieve a tight coupling as possible because any sort of perturbation in communication is bad. Okay? So it's probably best to in integrate the acceleration component onto as close as possible onto, onto the die, into the, into the core, so forth. Of course, you know, you can achieve, or you can have two components, but because you're dominant, any sort of acceleration you do in the future, you put it in the CPU or the GPU core. That's probably the best thing to do. Okay. And, I, and okay, so I was going to say a few more things, but I'll be, I hurry up. Okay, so I point out that all successful large systems have followed this principle, be it CPU systems or GPU systems, and they will for XL systems as well. Why is not just Fugaku, but machines like Frontier, or uh, why are they designed such that all you nodes are uniform. It's heterogeneous inside, but they are uniform on the outside. Why is that? Because they have to follow this principle. Okay? Finally, what do we, then how do we accelerate? My final point is we really have to look at where the architecture is going, and also we have to, div we have to you know, devise new algorithms we have to achieve algorithm revolution. Right now, there's a spectrum of algorithms with different complexity. It turns out that the low-order algorithms don't do, still are dominant, are major portions. There are some high-order ones. But because Moore's Law is ending and we can't increase the flops, as we know, then it'll be the realm of going to low-order algorithms. That's the only way. And because, the, because there are some untapped potential going through like 3D stacking and so forth with these types of new architectures and technologies that allow for a massive de uh, uh, decrease in data transfer. But you can't increase the flops as much because the transistor power will saturate, become constant. So there should be a whole movement, and there are, actually there is, to move your algorithms to become low order, not high order. For and then for something that, that's intractable that way, like things like quantum chemistry, some of the quantum chemistry codes, then we resort to quantum, which, by the way, is sort of an MDOS accelerator. Okay? So we see that as a future. I'll skip over the rest of the slides in the interest of time. And of course, we're working with the quantum people. I'm sorry I have to skip them over. And we have projects to look at the, you know, look at the band, how we increase the bandwidth and system and exploit it. And in fact, we're hiring people. We're trying to hire people to do that. So if you're interested, come talk to us. Okay? So that ends my talk. Thank you very much.